The following program is a UWTV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection. Hello and welcome to Upon Reflection, I'm Marsha Alvar. In the spring of 1991, almost 1,600 people from around the world gathered in New York to share a history that many had kept hidden for more than 50 years. Journalist Jane Marks was there for New York Magazine. Now she's collected the stories of 23 of these remarkable people in The Hidden Children, The Secret Survivors of the Holocaust. Marks writes a family therapy column for Parents Magazine, specializing in the problems of children and families. Welcome to Upon Thank Reflection. You. Who were the people who gathered in that hotel in New York in 1991? Who are the hidden children? The hidden children are the Jewish children who were hidden from the Nazis in Nazi-occupied Europe. They were not in the camps and they were not killed. Unlike Anne Frank, who, whose story we all know so well, these children survived and they lived in extraordinary circumstances. Some were um, brought into families as um, an adopted child or um, a distant relative from the city uh, who they'd say well, there's not enough food in Paris so you know we've, they've sent her here and if, if they looked Christian they could get away with that. Other times they hid um, in convents or out of sight altogether not just hiding their Jewishness but hiding their existence and that took place in forests attics, um, holes in the ground, bunkers under barns, caves, and even the sewer. Now, were children at, at, at more risk than adults during, during the, the, the terror well, of the yes, Nazis? Well, um, yes. Hitler wanted all the children dead because that was a way to ensure that uh, Jews would be wiped out if the, there would not be another generation. And um, very often in town, the parents were allowed to exist because they could go to forced labor camp but the children were supposed to have been killed by then. And um, it, we, in several of the stories, the children had to hide um, even when the parents were, were known, but then it would get worse and, uh, when the parents were about to be deported or taken off. The, the Nazis had made children special targets, and, and as a result, of, and according to an essay in the back of the book, the survival rate for children was much lower yes, it was. than for adults. Yes, and although let's not forget how low it was for adults. In one town in Poland, a man uh, who was a, one of the little boys in the book recalls that there were uh, 25,000 Jews before the war and 35 after, 35 people. So the, the chances of surviving were so, so tiny, and yet these children were so brave and so patient and so tenacious. I mean, that's the image I have of them is just one of, of such heroic strength to hang on when there was far from a guarantee that they'd make it, when, when the chances were that they wouldn't make it. And yet, remarkably, they had optimism. They, they really believed, they, they never doubted they were going to make it, as frightening as, as it was from moment to moment. As you mentioned, children were special targets. Of, of the Nazis and and their uh, the, I think the statistic that's used in the back of the book is that something like only seven percent mm -hmm. six to seven percent of the Jew the Jewish children in Europe at this time managed to survive the war and that and the conclusion is drawn that if that's the case then the vast majority of these children had to have been hidden because that's the only way they could have survived so the question arises why why not talk about this? Why has this history been hidden? Because these children were considered the lucky ones compared mm. to the children who went to the camps, compared to the children who were killed. Uh, when the war was over, their parents needed to believe that the children had been fine because the parents had suffered very much and they'd lost people. And it wasn't a time to, um, to, to, be, uh, to be mourning. There wasn't time for grief and mourning and, and rituals. It was necessary to get on with life. Sometimes a beloved father was killed and already replaced by a stepfather by the time the child and the mother were reunited and there, there was no parents just were not psychologically sophisticated then they didn't know how much these children needed to be heard and be, be listened to and to heal so the, the children decided to find their strength in moving forward and just get on with life 
and that was how they were encouraged. And they did find strength. Uh, they've, as a group, they are remarkably um, accomplished, affluent. They're dynamic. They're so many of them are therapists. Oh yes, an amazing number. Ma and many of them went into helping profes professions of various kinds: nursing, teaching. Um, yes, and as you say, quite a few are. Uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, and social workers, I think for two reasons. Um, to show their gratitude for being alive, to try to give back some of the sensitivity that they acquired, and also probably to continue to work on their own trauma because it was massive and it, the healing is such a process and such a long process. You talked with several dozen people yes. in preparing this book and you selected from that group the, yes, the, I selected uh, 23 stories. What was the basis for the decision? How do you decide whose story gets in and whose doesn't? Well, um, I guess for one thing, there, in every story that's in the book, I really loved the person. I really felt a very strong connection and um, it was very much a labor of love to, to listen, to draw them out, to listen and listen and listen and um, kind of put it together and uh, also each of these stories has a lesson about healing for the rest of us. There, as I said to you before the show started, it's a reader-friendly book. I wanted it to be um, a book that people who would never dream of reading a book about the Holocaust would be interested in because it is about courage and it is about survival. And I didn't write it to say, oh, these poor pathetic souls, uh, look what happened to them. I wrote it to, to celebrate their survival. And and there's nothing pathetic to, about these no, people at all. No, absolutely not. And, and to thank them for doing everything they had to do to survive, to be there for us as, as role models, because they are. Tell us a, a story of one of the hidden children. All right, I'll tell you about um, Christine, who was a little girl um, in a ghetto in Poland, living with her parents and her two-year-old brother. and. Uh, the father understood that um, life was going to get worse, and Christine and her brother were out of sight for the reason I mentioned before. Jew Jewish children were supposed to be gone by then. And they tunneled into the sewer. The father dug a hole, and they tunneled into the sewer. And it was as bad as you could imagine. The stench, the disease, the webs and the moss, the rats a foot long, not enough food, um, human predators, other sewer workers. There was one sewer worker who was kind of taking care of them. He would bring them food and try to keep them safe. They had given him all their worldly goods before they went down there, and he agreed to be loyal, and loyal he was. Um, but after a few weeks or months of this life, Christine just stopped talking and eating. She couldn't stand it. She got very depressed, and this lovely man, Christian sewer worker, picked her up and carried her down the tunnel and till they could see a beam of light and he said look up there someday you'll go up there and you'll live like other children but for now you have to be very strong and after that she was a survivor in every sense she said she lived on instinct like an animal she didn't have to be told to be quiet and stealthy even her two-year-old brother understood you have to just be this way and they went on that way um, the rats were a, a foot long, and uh, she, I asked if she was frightened. She said, oh, no, um, we played with them. They, uh, they were, were like yes, pets to these children. Pets and toys. They had no other pets or toys. Mm. And uh, the sewer worker brought Sabbath candles for her mother and books so that her father could teach her to read and write. And uh, again, the, the assumption was they would make it, and she'd go up there and have to go to school. It reminds me of another story in this book, and it's just an absolutely wonderful story of a family. Again, this is mm -hmm. an instance where a family is together in yes. hiding. And the and of the, the young child who talks about not having a menorah. Oh, yes, the, the Hanukkah story. That they were, they'd been traveling, crossing the Pyrenees for many days with no food at all, just licking dew off the rocks. And this little girl, not knowing what was happening with other Jewish families, felt very sorry for herself because she remembered the lovely old life they'd had. And she um, said, oh, it's no fun. This is Hanukkah, but there's no menorah. We have no, no, no food, nothing. And her father said, don't be silly. They were hiding in a barn that night. And I want to emphasize that for most of the children, hiding was a process of going to perhaps 40 different hiding places. So it was not like one safe refuge. And always constant fear, Ca fear of betrayal. Yes, absolutely. And anyway, they were in this barn, and her father opened the door a crack, and he said, look up there. There's our menorah. And he, you know, she could pick out the stars for the menorah. And um, then 
he said, we'll play with a dreidel. Well, they had an imaginary dreidel. And remarkably, she won. It was a carrot. It, and yes, the, the, all they had to eat for the whole family was one limp stolen carrot that they'd saved for two or three days. And the carrot was the prize when she won this dreidel game. And magnanimously, she shared it with the whole family. Mm. And she said it was like a feast. It was the most wonderful Hanukkah. And they whispered songs, Jewish songs, Hanukkah songs. And she felt very close to God and very happy, and she said it really was a joyous, joyous celebration. Those are stories of, of children who, uh, who were in hiding as, as with members of their family. Yes. Other children had a very different experience. They certainly did. Some, many were separated from their families, and while it was for their own survival, the children really felt the separation as, as abandonment, and it was very, very difficult. Often they bonded with whoever their rescuers were, nuns or families, and it was very hard to get back, to be taken back. One little girl, when she saw her parents at the door, she was shocked and she pretended she didn't know who they were and she thought, maybe I can get away with it, but she went back. And there was no, again, parents didn't know that it, a little gradual transition would have helped the children adjust. They would go from one day, they have a crucifix over their bed and they're saying Catholic prayers, then, you know, almost the next day they're going to Hebrew school. And it was not easy, and the confusion and confused identity and uh, all that really remains with many of them, and it's something they're struggling with and working on, and it's, it's fascinating. I mean, they are aware of these issues that come from those early days, difficulty trusting, difficulty being assertive, fears. Um, one woman can't stand the sound of someone walking in boots behind her in the street. Another one can't stand the sound of a plane doorbell. overhead or a doorbell or a truck because of the associations and the nightmares and so on. And yet, in spite of all that, these people are living, I mean, it's just so amazing to me that they're living not only normal lives, but really wonderful lives. How did their stories begin to emerge? Well, um, some women had seen a film. A few of the uh, women um, in the book had seen a film um, made by a Belgian woman um, called As If It Was Yesterday about Belgian rescuers. I think this woman's mother had been um, a hidden child or a survivor. And um, these women found it very touching and they felt, well, I am I was rescued. I'd like to meet other people who were rescued. I think we need to share our stories and we need to tell the world because this is really the untold story of the Holocaust and one that will not be around forever because these people you know, began to see their own mortality and understood that they are the last living witnesses and must tell their story. So that um, a book like this will um, be here for when we're dead, when our children are dead, the stories will remain. And anyway, they did um, organize this wonderful gathering and little by little the uh, word spread. Um, I had done an article for New York Magazine that many hidden children saw and that brought um, brought it to their attention and also the press began to pick it up and it really snowballed so by the time the gathering took place they had 1600 uh, hidden children there from all over the world including some who had just come out of hiding who really hadn't ever told their stories one, one man in the book never told his daughter his story and I said don't you think she'd understand because his daughter is a psychiatrist and he said oh yes I'm sure she'd understand but I'm afraid I might cry and I don't allow that. Hmm. I want to uh, take a few minutes to look at uh, some footage of an exhibit that's uh, at the Seattle Children's Museum and it's about the Holocaust and it's to teach children about hmm. it. And it's called Remember the Children, Daniel's Story. Look at that now. My name is Daniel. In 1933, around the time your grandparents were kids, I was six years old. I want to tell you the story of what happened to me and my family and what happened to millions of other kids and their families too. I grew up in a country called Germany. 
It was a beautiful country, and we were proud to be Germans. My father fought in the First World War and won a medal for being a hero. I wanted to be a hero, too. Nobody understood me, and I understood nobody for a while. When did your mother get out then? She got out actually in 1941. Oh, wow. Did you, did you, did she get, did she go to England too then? No, she managed to get to Cuba. Yeah, there was a refugee community in Cuba, and then she came to the United States. One day, my father stopped reading the newspaper with me. He said, Things were going on in our country that were too scary for a six-year-old to read about. People called Nazis were now running Germany. The Nazis hated lots of people, but they hated Jews most of all. Why can't people buy at Dad's store? Aren't we Germans? Why are they burning books? Can fire destroy ideas? I want. Why do I have to sit here? Why won't my Christian friends talk to me now? Have I changed? Why won't my Christian friends talk to me now? Why are they breaking windows? Why are they burning my synagogue? Why can't I go to my school anymore? What have I done wrong? Why is there a war? Why do we have to leave home? Where are they sending us? Why do we have to leave home? They put us on trains and took us far away. They made us live in a special neighborhood surrounded by fences and barbed wire. This was called the ghetto. And we couldn't leave. Soldiers with guns guarded the gates. It was strange and scary. So many new people, like gypsies from Austria and Jews from all over Europe, speaking so many languages. We were forced to live in a small room with two other families. No one ever had any privacy. We hung bedsheets to separate us. I really missed having my own room like I used to. We all missed so many things. Der Tate is nit gefroren handlen, Lulineke mein Sinn. We suffered in this ghetto for three years, but at least I was with my mom, dad, and Erica. Many other children weren't so lucky. We were all put to work, even Erica and I, from sunup to sundown, and we never had enough to eat. The ghetto was dirty and smelled awful. Bugs and rats were everywhere, and people were always getting sick. It was like jail. The Nazis treated us like criminals. That terrible train ride seemed to take forever. Suddenly, Nazi guards yanked open the doors. We were blinded by the sun. I will always remember that awful smell in the air. Guards surrounded us. They took all our things. Men to the left, women to the right, they shouted. Dad and I hugged Mom and Erica before they were separated from us. We were in a concentration camp with all kinds of people that the Nazis hated. One whole part of the camp was for gypsies. There were many children there. One day, the Nazis took us out of this place and back to a camp in Germany. It was no better. We were there only a short time before American soldiers came. They opened the camp and we were finally free. 
my father and I barely survived. We were among the lucky ones. Mom and Erica were not. I'll always remember them. My story is only one of the many that happened to children all over Europe. Over one million children were killed by the Nazis. We must remember so that no one will ever hurt people like this again. Listen to the stories of others who were children when all of this happened. Listen and remember. Sorry for all the people that went to that. Really horrible. I think it's sick how they put people in concentration camps because they're different. We need to go now. <laughs> A brief look at Remember the Children. Daniel's story was produced by Jim Pease and Andy Hellman. When this exhibit was on display at the Seattle Children's Museum, originally created at the, the new National Holocaust Museum in, in Washington, D.C., there were letters in the paper from parents who are worried about their children seeing this exhibit and asking the question, children are already so frightened, why are we going to show them this? Well, I, again, I feel that these stories would give children a very um, good sense, not only of the storehouse of human experience in history, which they, they really need to know and ought to know, but um, I, I think it would it would inspire them. I think that they would see children in very difficult situations, but um, children being resourceful and brave and clever and outsmarting the bad people, and and triumphing in the end. I mean, these are are you know adventure stories extraordinaire, and they're true. And I think they're a lot. Uh, there's a, a lot more value in there than than you know, some of the cartoons and whatnot. Uh, what has been the impact on these individuals of going public with their stories? Well, I think it was very difficult at first for many of them. Um, Must have felt like a terrible kind of vulnerability. Absolutely, absolutely. Very. One woman said, I feel exposed and humiliated. Mm. Um, but it, was, it also led to more healing and more healing. They f um, the uh, Anti-Defamation League in New York has a Hidden Child Foundation that anyone can join for a very small fee. Um, you can get a newsletter, and even if you don't join, they can put you in touch with um, support groups all over the country and Europe and Israel. And there even are support groups for children of hidden children because when there is such a secret in a family, it definitely impacts on the children. And um, it, the children, you know, were worried about their parents. They knew they've suffered terribly, but um, you know, if it's so terrible, they can't even talk about it. It's it must be, you know, and they, they would imagine even worse. And uh, they would be over solicitous to their parents. There'd be some role reversal. Um, in some cases, the hidden children feel they were too tough on their kids. That they demanded perfection as a way, of, in a loving way, of trying to protect the children, thinking if you get all A's, there won't be another Holocaust. Mm. Or if there is, at least you'll be okay. I mean, it's a fantasy, but... There's a great variety of experience in these stories. The hiding took, took many forms, Absolutely. took many shapes. And, and also the rescuers. Yes, there they, was a they great really variety. ran the gamut. Um, rescuers could be, it could be a nun, it could be the village priest, it could be uh, the poorest farmer um, or uh, a nobleman, an aristocrat in a 47-room house with, with a maid. Um, it, it absolutely ranged, and on this um, book promotion tour, I met a hidden child in Houston who recently reconnected with the daughter of her rescuer uh, in France, and last summer she went over and met her and said, why do you think your father took us in, my sister and me, two Jewish children? You could have been killed, the whole family could have been killed, why did he do it? And the woman looked at her simply and smiled and said, well, wouldn't you? Hmm. So I think it was that. I, I don't think that there were many intellectual uh, reasons for doing it. Some did it very spontaneously. Some were part of an organized resistance, but many of them were not. They were just ordinary people, human beings, who felt they were in a position to save a life. And it, they weren't necessarily Jew lovers. Some of them were actively Jew haters, but they still could respond to a human being in need. And there's, uh, there are so many shades of, uh, of humanity in this book, from the great 
courage and the great heroes to uh, oh to some and there were some very sad situations where I don't know if you remember the story of Lola when she's in the ghetto with her mother and they're hiding uh, the Nazis are coming to raid the ghetto and there were two hiding places and Lola and her mother at the last they were headed for one at the last minute they went into the other and um, the one that they had not gone into was immediately raided and as the Jews were being taken out one man just was so upset he betrayed the others. He said there were Jews in there too. And Lola was astonished that even the good guys were, couldn't necessarily be trusted. And as it happened, the, the Nazis started to try to um, break down the wall, but it was too solid. And they said, oh, that Jew probably just lied to make work for us, and they walked away. What kind of uh, impact did getting assigned to cover this story uh -huh. Have on, have on your life. Massive, incredible. I mean, it's enriched my life so much. Even my whole family's gotten involved, too. Um, some of the hidden children who were rather furtive at first, when, you know, in initial contact, some didn't want to tell me their whole names or where they lived. Uh, I've become very close friends with many of them. Uh, one is my Saturday morning tennis partner. <laughs> another, um, with, we've shared birthday parties and um, one, a couple of hidden children invited uh, our family to their Seder. Um, last year, and w I, I treasure their friendship. They're wonderful, wonderful people. And one friend, when I was researching the book, said, oh, it would be so depressing. I'd hate to do it. I, I wouldn't even want to meet a hidden child. And I thought, how short-sighted, and you're so wrong. I mean, these are gutsy people. They're dynamic. They're funny. They're super intelligent. And they're, you know, if you saw them in a group, you'd think, what a, you know, great bunch of middle-aged people, <laughs> uh, very active and fit and um, full of beans mm. and certainly not uh, sad cases. Survivors in every in sense every of every sense, word. right. But in, inside, there's, there's one man who's um, a psychologist and a psychoanalyst and he has a training institute with 40 graduate students and yet he still, every time he goes to a meeting of child survivors, he puts up a notice wondering if anyone's seen his father, and he knows in his heart that his father mm. was killed when, when this man was four. But he said, you know... Still looking. Yeah. It's part of optimism, part yes. of being human. Jane Marks, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on Upon Reflection, a collection of remarkable stories in the hidden children, the secret survivors of the Holocaust. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org slash classics.